Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Late Drop presented by Futures. From one foot, 60 foot, Futures has you covered. They are the gold standard of fins. They're the fins of choice that I use and many other big wave servers in the world. So support them because they support us and ride Futures. Today's guest needs no introduction. His young superstar, Kai Lenny. Uh, we get into his recent swell trip to Nazare. Uh, we also talk about his new web series uh, with Red Bull TV uh, called The Life of Kai. Uh, I had a great time chatting with the young man. I hope you enjoy it. I always get the first wave. Pretty much I, it brought me to tears like the wave was so good. That's the biggest drop I've ever taken in my life. And so right there I told myself I needed to just relax and stay calm that I'm stronger than this. Well, Kai Lenny, the superstar himself, um, thank you for joining the late drop, my man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, super stoked to be on with you. This is awesome. Yeah. So um, I guess first things first, I'd like to, um, how, was, how was that Nazareth swell uh, you, you guys went over for? i uh, like to get your thoughts on that. Obviously, the whole world saw uh, the content and the footage and stuff, but uh, was that the biggest that you, you've seen it so far? Yeah, I think that was definitely the biggest waves I've seen at Nazare for sure. And maybe some of the tallest waves I've ever seen. You know, when we first drove down to the harbor early that morning, the waves were breaking farther out than I had ever seen. And it was pretty remarkable because it still felt like the place could hold way bigger. Like it was just tapping into that big mama wave. And I just had this feeling that this wave must have gotten way bigger before and probably will get bigger in the future. But up to that point, you know, I think a lot of people didn't know where to sit because it was pure towing that day. Um, I just noticed all the jet skis. Everyone was sort of like not sure where to be because the normal lineup was different. Um, we were actually like more in the channel to, for that big mama section. And even the left coming off of that was like past first peak. It was like, I don't even know what you would call that, like half peak or something. Uh, but it was pretty crazy. Uh, it was crazy, though, how fast the swell came down, too. Like, it was like, for sure, at, the night before was 100 feet. And then come the next day, it was like only six to eight feet. So the, the come down was just massive. I thought it was going to last a lot longer. Yeah, because I, I wondered, there was no, it looked like there was no, um, I didn't see any photos or footage of anyone um, trying to paddle so I was guess I'm guessing that just like you said it just it just went down so fast that that was it yeah like even that afternoon from the morning to the afternoon it was already dropping really fast but people were still towing because it was still at that size where a crazy big one out the back would come in and I think that's what kind of like didn't motivate anybody to uh, paddle and then Lucas and I were thinking about paddling the next day like oh it could still be 25 feet and then we took the ski out there and it was literally only eight feet. Uh, and it was really weird because we were kind of looking at each other as how could it go from a hundred feet to eight feet in less than 12 hours um, from like the other day. So that was pretty, pretty crazy. Um, but I just wish that swell had hit in the morning um, versus in the middle of the night, just because I think it would have been crazy to see how much bigger it actually was. Yeah, you know, you know what's really funny is that the um, the Hercules swell did the exact same thing. So when we were at uh, Belhera waiting that day, that night, you just it was already on the way down, and it was giant. And but you knew that through the night it would have been. I mean, I don't even like saying a hundred feet, you know, but guaranteed, yeah. like what what you see the the day of and what you know that it was like through the night, you're just like, wow. Like I wish I. Wish I could just have night vision goggles and just see how big it would have been like through the middle of the night because yeah, the two of the biggest storms in the last decade have peaked at at night, which is a real shame. Yeah, it's so 50-50, right? Like 50% it could come in the night and then 50% it could come during the day. I I, I agree, like saying 100 feet is hard, but I also think that um, – waves have been maybe not measured as big as they truly are and you know it's like how do you even measure a big wave truly because it's like a lot of it is like the lens somebody has the angles but i think in person when you're watching some of these waves you're like gosh like if that's not 100 feet i don't know what it is because every time i've ever been to a big city and i look up and look at a 10-story building which is 100 feet go gosh i swear i've seen waves that big and i've seen people like take off on waves that big 
Um, so, but I, 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 you know, if, if I was considering that it was that big during the day, that's why I thought, oh, the night before it must've been crazy big. Cause literally in the Harbor and you know, when you come into where the jet skis are and you're driving down that road and there's that little glimpse between the Harbor, the waves are yeah. breaking past that opening. And previously, like the contest in February, um, last February, it was breaking kind of like way farther in from there. And that was still a giant day. I mean, Maya broke the women's record with that giant wave. And, um, you know, it just seemed like it was the water was, the, even the current inside the uh, the harbor was moving. And I remember Carlos Brule actually telling me he'd never seen that much current in there, even on that big Hercules, Hercules day. Because I asked him, like, how does this compare already? He's like, well, I've never seen the current move like this in here. And that's when my heart sort of dropped because we were only just going out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's funny too, because as you are going out through that river mouth, it has that little stationary wave feel to it where you get that reverse current and you see, see the little waves stacking up. And yeah, the, 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 the day that I saw like that as well was the day that Francisco and uh, Rod, Rodrigo's Coxo got mm. their waves as well. And that was the, the only time that I've seen that thing like regurgitating through the river mouth. So I guess that's the tell sign. If you see it's doing some reverse current through the mouth as you're heading out on the jet ski, you know it's going to be giant. Yeah, totally. What was it like? Well, I mean, take us through, this, take us through the session. You were, you were, were you tying with Luca, with Luca, Luca, or, I mean, Lucas or Carlos, you guys teamed up together? Well, so, you know, when we, it gets really big, you, your team just continues to grow because it's like you need backups for backups and especially at Nazare and, Lucas and I, we're, we were going to team up in the beginning, but then we just decided we wanted to catch as many waves as possible because it was we knew the swell was going to peak kind of like, or it already had peaked and it was coming down. So he towed with um, his other partner, Ian, um, and then I towed with Carlos. And Carlos was like, I'll get one wave later on, but I just want to tow you guys. And I was like, okay, sweet. just That's awesome. But the thing is, we pulled out the back and all the, that's like I explained earlier, all the skis were in such a weird position. It took like even Carlos and I like 20 minutes to figure out, okay, well, like, where is the wave coming? Like we saw a couple big mama peaks, but when you're looking at it from behind, it was hard to see where it was like lining up. Cause in some way it did feel messy, but then once you figured out what waves were good, it, it was like very organized. It was just like kind of showing up to a new break and not knowing what's going on or what's the good ones to go on. And, you know, with Nazare too, it's not the farthest out sideways are the best. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of times you'd see somebody towing into a wave that looked gigantic. It was like a hundred foot swell and then it would just never break and it would just keep yeah. going or it would come down. And, you know, watching guys like the people who got in the rhythm, I think the fastest was like just, you know, Sebastian and Maya and then Lucas and Ian. I noticed that they were going for the inside ones. And I just remember towing with Lucas last time. I'm like, okay, the inside ones are always the tallest, even though they look like insiders. It's the most yeah. weird sort of like opposite of what you would imagine. Um, and then uh, I just remember catching a really big left and it was just really bumpy and it was, you know, backside out there. You can't tell where you're going because there's no wall, like a traditional wave. It's just such a huge pyramid and having that white water just tap into your back. Like, Oh, it just, it was just really an interesting day. It took me a while to sort of warm up, but I think where, things felt the most real wasn't even when I was on a wave was actually when we uh, Carlos and I swapped and I'm like okay I'll catch you a wave and I towed him into a wave that was so big but it just ended up not breaking and I remember he kicked out and I was like coming on the ski and I looked behind and I think to this day it was well for sure to this point the biggest wave I'd ever seen break behind it just seemed like twice as big as anything I've been in front of and I remember going, okay, this is going to have to be the best pickup of all time. And it was funny, though, because our spotters couldn't see the lineup very well. And um, because there was such big waves, it actually created like a salt fog over the cliff. Yeah. And we were kind of cold and in the dark at that point. And I remember Carlos just being like, oh, this one. And it looked good, but we had no idea the next one was twice as big and actually was going to break. And I remember if I didn't pick up Carlos, it probably would have been the worst experience of his life. And I'm like, even when I got him on the ski and we we're going, we had a lot of time between the wave was catching us so fast. And I'm going, Oh my gosh, like if I go faster, I might lose Carlos on the back of the sled. Cause that white water was like just so big. And we were just aiming towards the, the, the trench, that channel. 
um, cause we were all the way onto the right. And, uh, you know, it was just that one image of like looking back and just seeing the way the white water was, it just seemed on another level. It's hard to describe kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to describe unless you, unless you haven't been there. And that's, I think that, you know, I've said it a million times. It's, it's until you've been there and you've been in the water and I, I, I know how it looks like a mush burger. You, like you can see it, right? You can, you can see it, but you don't realize that how big that actual top to bottom is before it actually breaks and then goes another fit like 40, 50 feet. Like it's a 40 to 50 foot top to bottom wave. And then it hits and rolls another 40 to 50 feet. It's just, it's radical. And, and like you said, the, 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 like the wave that you got the right, that nice right that you got in the contest. When, when you look at that and you look at where Lucas pulled you in, like there was all the guys were out the back waiting for bigger wave and those waves that come in and keep the energy and don't ca cap out the back. I feel the ones that come in and then when it hits the inside does do that pyramid jack and actually look the tallest the, the, to me, unless you get big, big, big mama, that's legit one that breaks, you know, cause you know, like that Cody's wave and that, you know, they're, they're giant. And then you, and you look and you're like, oh, and it happens all the time. And you're like, oh, it's just, it, it barely broke. You know, like it's yeah. such a big lump of water. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's so scary and gnarly, but like, how's that thing look a hundred feet? And then it barely breaks. Like, or it'll just be breaking yeah. as it kicking out into the channel, you know, but you're like, if you see the image of that person, that girl or guy in that way, you're like, that thing is massive. Like it's giant, giant. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. It's such a weird experience because, I mean, I think a lot of people back in the day especially wrote it off as a mush burger, but then you go there and you experience it. And it's it's so different than other big waves. And, and in my experience, you know, you go to a place like Jaws or Mavericks or any wave that hits kind of a reef bottom, a shelf, and the wave's moving really fast out at sea, and then it kind of hits the bottom and stacks. And then the speed you get from riding, it's actually across the wave versus like forward. Whereas Nazare, it, it doesn't ever lose its speed. It just seems like it goes faster and faster and faster. Like almost as if when it breaks, it finally lets go of that energy. Um, and that white water is just, you can't even stand up against it. Like if it taps you, it's game over. And I had like my biggest wave that day was his right. And it was like still kind of that mush burger. Cause it was like, I think barely breaking on big mama, but I can remember once that white water touched me, it was just vaporized me at the end. And I was yeah. like almost in the channel, but it just vaporized me. There was no like fighting it like some other big waves where that energy kind of shoots out and then relaxes and then shoots out again. It was just like getting ran over. And, yeah. you know, all my training I thought I did was going to pay off in the summer. Couldn't have like, you know, it didn't help the way I thought it might have if I got hit by that white water. And then eventually, like when I went left and I had my GoPro and I was just trying to get a couple GoPro clips because my thoughts were, I just want to like get a couple shots of what it might feel like to surf a wave out here. And then I ended up falling and getting pounded. That was just like, I tried to ride that wave as safe as possible. Like if you watch the land angle, I wasn't taking any risks by going super deep because, you know, I had a pole in my hand and I'm like, yeah, I'll just get a couple shots and then I'll drop the pole and I'll go like go deeper and really focus on making it. Um, but that wave just peels outwards like that. And sometimes you could be on the shoulder and it still will get you. And what, um, is it the fastest you've ever gone on the surfboard? Do you think out there? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think so. Go for sure. The fastest I've gone that right. I can remember, um, you know, and it felt like the biggest wave I have ever ridden. I'm not sure if it like actually looks it, but the one thing that I noticed was that I had this big right and it was like, Sebastian went left and I remember seeing Garrett McNamara at the bottom driving a jet ski like he was getting caught inside as a safety ski and you know at that point he had to go left or right and he decided to go left and I remember just initially dropping in and like yelling out to Garrett like woohoo like this is insane like as I passed his wake and then all of a sudden like locking into a speed I haven't felt and just luckily knowing trusting my board could handle it um, I was skipping faster than I'd ever gone. And it could have been because I was on this right going into this channel and there was all this kind of like current coming up it. So it could have given me that illusion. But these waves that day just seemed like they were moving a little bit quicker. And I also think because they weren't focused in on like first peak or second peak, which is way inside, they were so far out. They had that open ocean swell feeling. Like, you know, if you do a downwinder and you get on one of those 
big like yeah. 15 foot swells in the channel you they feel so fast because they're just kind of traveling it had that same feeling and i think that's why a lot of these big mama waves weren't breaking top to bottom even though they were like super steep they were almost like outrunning the when they the way they were breaking um and then i think you know that wave like i said the night before for sure it was like way bigger and it reminds me of like hugo val's wave i couple years ago where that thing was actually top to bottom big mama so um you know that one wave where carlos and i were you know driving away on the jet ski that one broke top to bottom at big mama and i think that yeah. was one of only a couple that broke and it was just really bizarre too not to see somebody on it like nobody surfed the left or the right of that wave wow uh, and i just remember thinking like why wasn't anybody on that wave like I wish I was on that wave, but why wasn't anyone there? And I think because it just broke in another place out in the ocean, like a little farther out, and nobody like had anticipated it because already yeah. people had moved more in front of first peak for those lefts. And that was around the same time Lucas got his giant left. That was a closeout. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I think it's it's just, it's just the visions, you know, as a surfer, you you know and you feel like – certain certain sessions you're like wow man like that was really gnarly and giant and huge and the photos or the footage might make it feel like that but you know being in the water is really the only test you know like just that gut feeling that you have and you know it's like those days at George right the El Nino year when obviously the Aaron Gold day like the waves were giant and they looked super tall but like even the the, the morning after and those double days like some of those the size of those waves like picture wise weren't much bigger than other swells that we see all the time. But but there was something about the energy of those El Nino years, like the intervals and just when they were coming on, you know, back-to-back -back swells that you can't, you can't feel it unless you're out in the water and you're feeling it and you're seeing it and you just like feel that energy and feel how fast the ocean's moving. Like you, you really can't, you really can't get a gauge of what it, what it is from the land or from a photo or from a video. Yeah, no, there's like this weird thing where I I feel like when waves get to a certain size, maybe they stop going vertically and they stack with energy. And then if it's bigger than that, then they start getting tall again. Like it's like this weird, like tall, stack with energy, get tall again, like these stages. Because I, I mean, talking with you about like the uh, 2016, you know, I felt like Jaws was like, it wasn't getting taller anymore. It was just getting like thicker and like folding on itself. Like gravity was stopping it from going upward so uh that was just it's really interesting to hear you talk about that and i you know i was actually i did think of you when we were out at um nazare because i know you're always keen to just paddle the biggest waves ever paddled and i was thinking about like could you catch one out here right now and mm. i think for sure you could the problem was just like maybe getting caught inside like you'd almost yeah. have to do like a step off where like you're on a ski and you're like, okay, this is the position, jump off and like, then go for it. Cause like that whole thing with Carlos was like, literally I thought we were out in the middle of the ocean, like a mile outside the point. And when he kicked out of this wave that didn't even break, there was like a hundred foot wave behind it. And cause I had a couple of people as well being like, well, why didn't you think of paddling? I'm like, well, it's not so much like w not wanting to try to paddle a wave so tall. It's just the consequences around trying to do that. Like you're going to get caught it's just inevitable on a day yeah. like that. And so, yeah. yeah, yeah, I, 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 you know, I think that there comes a point where you, you have to really, you know, what's, what's it worth to you? What's, what's the ego? Um, look on a, on a, like, I'm going to take a step back because the Mavericks contest in 2010, just talking about swells and how they move and how they like that swell was a really, um interesting numbers like it was 20 like 21 feet like 21 feet at 17 seconds right so it had a really high swell height but the period wasn't so big you know but but they were um catching makeable waves off the second shelf there right and yeah and and it was bad that's the one that dorian in the morning was getting barreled right so like to me like out of all the stuff that i've seen like to me i think that's the best paddleable swell that that I've seen at Mavericks, um, you know, and it was the number, it was the way the numbers were, right? So not a high period. So it wasn't sort of folding on itself. It actually, the swell height was high enough. The, the period wasn't too high. And maybe that was just a magic number that 
let it all just come to a point where you could, it wasn't folding on itself, losing energy, but it was big enough just to catch the second reef and you've got a, a perfect number, right? And maybe there's a perfect number at Jaws and maybe there's a perfect number at, at Nazare, you know, but I look, there was a few years back, I, I went out one day in the morning and with Hugo, Garrett, Cody, and I tried to paddle like first peak, mate, like somewhere out there, maybe even a little deeper. And I, I just, I got so hung up in the lip and just like disintegrated. And, and I just, after that, I was just like, you know what? I, I don't want anything to do with this really. Like it was just, it's so hard like to be in the spot to position yourself paddling out there. You just, I mean, it's like Belhera. You, you honestly just have to be lucky. There yeah. isn't, there's no skill. I don't care who you are. There's no skill about it. You can be in the realm of a paddle wave. And even when it's perfect at Nazare, like contest size paddle, like I like the waves that aren't first peak and aren't second peak that are inside. There's a wedge, right. That's a, like a one and a half peak, you know, yeah. but, you know, it's, it's just, it's, to think that you know that spot or to think that you could paddle out to Big Mama and if one wave breaks in seven hours, to think that you're going to be in the right spot to get that wave. I mean, hey, maybe someone will get lucky, but uh, the risk versus reward to me um, when, when I try and think about that is just and – the, and the risk that you're putting on your rescuers that if you were to get caught there inside and then you're not – far enough to the channel and then now you're getting sucked, you know, towards the rocks and, oh man, I, I, it makes my, my, my skin <laughs> shiver when I think about it, you know? Well, you brought up a good point with like the swell period. Cause I noticed like the best paddle sessions that I've ever had and the best consistent wave riding I have seen from people like at a Jaws has been on a smaller period, but a bigger swell. And then as soon as you get into that, like 18 to 20 second interval, there's a lot of waves unridden because they're just folding so hard. And it's just like, it's not necessarily that you can't get in, but it's just like, where are you going to go after you get in? And then, you know, thinking about Mavericks as well, I think it was like a couple years ago, I think Chumbo and maybe it was Luca and Hotman. And it was that giant day out there. I don't know. Were you out there that day? You know, the nah. one day that was like rolling through. Yeah. That, that was it. Yeah. yeah, that day was that, that again. That was a um, yeah. I'd like to. I don't remember what the numbers were on that day. They had a small window, but yeah, Pete Mel and that they got caught by a second reef one rolling through. But yeah, I'm a true believer in that. There, there's special numbers, and you know, like we always see a lot of those, like twelve at twenty or eleven at eighteen at Jaws. You know, like there's a lot of. Um, you know, the small wave height, big periods, which still make Jaws insanely big. But, you know, I'd really love to see a, like a 17 at 17 or, yeah. a, or a 20 at 16. You know, like it's been, yeah. a, been a while. Like what would that look like again? Like would that be just really makeable waves, but the height, like the, the, the height gets higher. It's not moving as fast as a 20 second. It's more approachable. You know, maybe it's, starting to you know do more of the thing up the north the north point there you know who knows you know but it'd be interesting to get something like where the numbers are more even like the swell height and the period height are more leveled out than sort of just one way or the other well remember when shane kind of got his that crazy barrel at the end of the day it was like that two-day swell where i think it was like um the whole world sort of converged on peahi um it, I just remember that period, it seemed like it was a little less. And that just like, it got rid of that kink that Jaws sometimes has, you know, because like Jaws will have that like double up so you can get in, but then you're dealing with this knuckle. And then yeah. you might end up in that knuckle going in the air or getting sucked up. And it was just like, I, watching some of that footage again, like Shane was able to get into these super big, tall waves, but it just didn't have that kink. And then he was able to set up like a toe style barrel. Um, yeah. and that's, was like, oh, that's pretty crazy. Uh, so I've thought about that. It seems like, um, I was actually having this discussion with my brother the other day that I think we've been spoiled the last few years with big wave surfing. Like I remember now as a kid being here on Maui and it reminds me of this season where there wasn't one swell, it was just windy and rainy and kind of crappy surf the whole year. And 
I, I remember now that there wasn't even one year, it was like more frequently and just coming off that crazy run of that big wave paddling, the start of that big wave paddling era with like the 2011, you know, paddles days at Jaws up to like, you know, the contests at Nazare and stuff. It just seems like there was an era where there was always really good big waves. And I'm just concerned that the next few years, maybe we're, we're going into a drought, but at the same time, I'm hopeful that it's only the beginning of this season. Well, and the, the great thing, well, hopefully, you know, if this, um, you know, if they ever let up on these restrictions with Corona, but the beauty is, is that, you know, El, La Nina is, it's great for Europe, you know, it's yeah. great for, it's great for the Atlantic and, you know, they're still been pumping waves over there and they've, you know, so they're, they're scoring right now, you know, so it's, the, that's the beauty of being able to, I guess, jump on a plane and, uh, yeah, if, if in a perfect world, if I had, you know, all the time and the money to, and to, I like this year without everything going on, I probably would have went and posted up in Europe for the first, you know, the first half, basically. Yeah. Just because I've seen it before, I've seen it before where you just know that, uh, you know, Europe loves it and it's, it's that great time of year, you know, September, October, November before it gets, the storms come in too harsh there and it gets too cold and windy, but um but you know he's crossing our fingers that uh you know it looks like there's the pacific starting to you know light up a little bit at the moment there's a few storms up there jet streams not quite pointed towards us so good but you know the west coast might get a few waves here and there but yeah maybe we just have to uh think after christmas we're going to get some yeah that's what i'm thinking um but i also want to go back to mavericks i didn't get it last season did you get over there last season at all um did I? I i think i did but it was yeah it wasn't there wasn't really anything special or anything to, that anyone missed i don't think so yeah no it just seems like uh you know even just thinking back to nazare like i wanted to stay there but i had to like go back to uh i actually had to do a trip to tahiti for a photo shoot for hurley and i just remember when i was leaving though it was like some of the best sandbars i've seen out there because you know, that sand is actually really far out early in the season and come the end of the season, it's away. But I was just figuring, I was like, oh, this place is probably going to be really good paddling on one of these, like, you know, no one's going to be paying attention to these smaller swells after, you know, the most colossal big one had come in in many years. So it could just be like, you know, some of the best beach break ever out there. Because it's actually like every wave was barreling. I can only imagine even if it was 15 to 20 feet, it's going to maybe like, become more like jaws in terms of every waves like a barreling versus kind of a survival avalanche yeah. um so yeah i'm keen on going back there if things aren't looking up i'm going to try to wiggle <laughs> my way back to europe <laughs> yeah didn't they, they, they banned it right after you guys with the, the massive crowds didn't they they banned ban surfing at nazare or something like that well yeah that was the most interesting thing is i've never seen that many people on the cliff in my life out at nazare i think maybe the one that the closest I've seen it was the toe contest, but especially the first uh, event out there that you did, that you won. Um, that seemed like it, like it was like that type of crowd where, um, and later on I found out that that crowd was like 30,000 people on the cliff. And actually just talking to my brother who was on the cliff as a spotter, initially he couldn't get down to go do that. And apparently there was a roadblock like right at that entrance, you know, where they either let you drive your car yeah. down or you have to park to the left. Uh, at the very top there, apparently there was thousands of people and there was like three cops like, no, you can't go. Like, <laughs> And then one person like charged one side and the cops all ran to stop them. And then yeah. everyone ran the opposite and just filled the cliff up. And there was like 30,000 people. And you know, I could definitely see why they were concerned. I hadn't heard if anyone got like, if it was like a super spread or COVID event. But then when I heard that it was like, uh, you know, banned, I was like, oh, that is the worst feeling ever. Imagine if you're a local there, you know? Yeah. And that's a bummer too, because I wanted to go back at some point. But I've kind of heard that they're letting it fly a little bit because it's been small. So guys can go and surf and no one's interested to view it. But I, I think the, te the test is going to be if a big swell comes and and then everyone like wants to go see the big swell if they're going to just bar the the harbor, yeah. you know, because if they don't open the harbor, you're screwed. Yeah, and that, well, and the it's the yin and the yang of over there. So the, the government, the mayor Walter, they they love it and they want to promote it, and they it's a great uh, economy boost for you know for Nazare and 
but then you have the you know everything else that goes with that you know so they're in a, they're in a tough spot but you know either way it's a, it's a one of the most uh you know it's a seventh wonder of the world for surfing you know whether you like the wave or not whatever it's you're just going there and seeing it from the top of that cliff it feels like you're back in game of thrones days you know like it feels with biblical <laughs> it feels biblical yeah. you know and um so yeah but hey i want to obviously want to talk about life of kai um i've been watching those episodes congratulations on that but but Thank i'd you. like to start from the beginning and sort of end it how it's got to life of kai you know kai lenny from growing up in maui as a grom to now having a, a series, you know, from Red Bull based on your life, you know, it's a pretty cool story. So, you know, I, I think your story has been told, told a lot, but I mean, yeah. you know, let's just, let's just start from the start, you know, like, uh, you were born in Maui, but your dad, your dad and your mum were from different areas and, and converged. I think they met windsurfing or I'm not sure, but you know, how did that all start for you? Yeah. So, you know, like over here on Maui, uh, attracted my parents. They were from California originally. Well, my mom moved all over America cause her dad was in the air force, but, uh, my dad was from Santa Barbara, um, pretty much came from nothing. And they basically met here on Maui after my dad moved here to come windsurfing with his pals. And he was working, you know, dishwasher at mama's fish house, which is like that nice restaurant up the yeah. coast. And, my mom had come out here and her sister was uh, running a company like, or her, my mom came out and her sister was a friend of who, of somebody who started uh, J crew. Um, and so they asked my mom, Hey, when you're out there, if there's some cool spots to like do a photo shoot for J crew, can, can you let us know? And my mom's like, yeah, absolutely. And mama's fish house was of course a really amazing spot. And at that point, my dad had already worked his way up from dishwasher to manager and uh and then so they kind of met and uh i remember they both my parents told me they both shared the interest in windsurfing uh and they both surfed as well but my dad at the time didn't know that and so the, the day they made a date to go windsurfing there was no wind ironically on the windiest place in hawaii <laughs> and then so she suggested to uh go surfing and that's when my dad fell in love with her because you know he started surfing you know before windsurfing and so you know, many years. And, um, my mom was, a, became a doctor. Well, she was a doctor, but became a doctor here on Maui at Kaiser. And then my dad continued to run mama's fish house and my brother and I came along. Um, and I just remember as a kid, we kind of were just always on their program, which was the best program. Cause if they weren't working, it was trying to spend time on the water. Um, and so there was actually, they were very busy people. And a lot of time we were like stuck at after school programs until like five or six, but on certain days they would, pick us up right after school and we would go uh, either surfing or go down to the beach and go windsurfing. And I can remember having like a definitive choice. Like I could play in the sand or I can like learn how to do these sports. And I always didn't like getting sandblasted here because it's so windy that I just decided to pick that up. And then, you know, as time sort of progressed, um, my brother and I were, I think, born in the right time at the right place to see a lot of emerging sports. And by individuals such as Dave Kalama, like Robbie Nash, Rush Randall, Laird, uh, and many others. And then, you know, the whole prone paddleboarding scene, which is when I first heard of you and you started coming over here and doing the local races as a warm up before uh, the big Molokai. I mean, it just seemed like at every point in the year, there was some sort of world championship event um, that was attracting people from everywhere. Uh, and so as a kid, my mind was, pretty much occupied the entire time of the year because there was always some sort of like sport or person to like look look forward to seeing or just watching them out on the water and that was just hugely inspirational um for me but i guess the earliest memory i ever had of a wave and bless it be my favorite spot in the world today is jaws you know i just remember a big swell and my dad taking us down to the cliff just to watch and, you know, we, we knew Dave and Laird and those guys just because my parents knew. It's a small island. We all lived on the North Shore. But I just remember thinking it was larger than life and how, what are the chances that this wave is breaking in front of me? Um, and so I kind of came semi-obsessed with the wave and them. And, you know, as a kid, highly impressionable. I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to be like my mentors and then impress yeah. them if I could. 
Yeah. So I, I, this is uh, not many people might know this, and but your middle name is Waterman, right? Yes. Yeah. So that, that's super. Su that's it's really interesting to me because that that means that your dad, like, how long was it be before like your mum and dad met? And they'd been in Maui before you were born. Well, uh, like only I think a couple of years before I was born. But it's yeah. funny because my middle name is actually a family name. I like crazy enough. Huh. It comes from my. It's my great grandmother's maiden name was Waterman. It wasn't Wasserman, like I guess of German descent, but it was actually Waterman. And so, like, part of me wishes, like, oh man, I wish that name would have like been my last name because it would have been cool. But you know, I'm going to rep the Lenny name as well, of course. But my great grandmother uh, was Waterman. And so my dad, like when he grew up in Santa Barbara, you know, in a surfing culture uh, with a bunch of surfing pals and then with windsurfing emerging. And then, of course, them moving out here because they saw what the watermen of Hawaii were doing. I think he always felt like, gosh, that's the coolest last. That would be the coolest middle name for one of my kids when I have them. And so that's how I sort of inherited that name. It wasn't like they were, you know, destining me to become a waterman of any kind. They just were like, hey, first kid is going to get this name because it's just too cool to like let disappear. Yeah. And so that's how that name came to be, to be okay. honest. Okay. That's, that's good. Good clarification because I'm like, wow, like I'm wondering like, geez, your dad like took a lot of guts to <laughs> just go, hey. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna be a yeah. he's gonna be a waterman, and I don't care what the, what he does, you know. But but that makes sense that it's that the name was in the family, and obviously, yeah, that that makes total sense. So that's yeah. cool because I'd always wondered, you know, I, I I I knew that that was it, and I was like, wow, I wonder like how that came about. So I'm glad you're able to clarify that for us. That's cool. I think if it was forest, I wouldn't have been into the water at all. <laughs> But I think too, like my parents, um, uh, you know, they never forced Ridge and I to go in the water. But I think when you were a kid, like back in like maybe the 90s, you know, the phones and social media didn't exist. So like when we were bored, we literally had to just play with our imagination. Um, and there was no like, let's look at the phone. Let's see what uh, what's going sp on. Sp it was sp more speaking of phones. Speaking of phones, <laughs> it's, it's always listening. Uh, no, so I think, and then also too, I think it's clear, it's really important to remember we were highly, like, we were very uh, motivated by the best in the world individuals coming here. Like Maui at one era was like the hot spot for like five different sports. Uh, so like, you know, I don't know, it, it just seemed like we became a product of our environment. And nowadays, like, all these sports exist, but it just doesn't seem like it has that same sort of energy as it once did um, just because I think it's existed and, you know, times have changed, but um, no, it's like, I'm really, we're really lucky to have had the parents we had because we never felt forced. And again, though, like how else were we going to spend our time on an Island, but go in the water? Like that's yeah. kind of all we, we kind of just grew up in that environment. Do you, you don't think that uh, the you don't think the next Kai Lenny is somewhere on Maui looking up to you like you did to Laird? Like you don't do you think that it's not it's just in your mind because you know when you get older everything's like oh the surf was always better when you were younger this was always better like you know I think it it may be age and just experience and maybe a little bit of um you know just getting older that you you may not think that I know what you mean by because the same thing I, I'm like oh, prone paddle boarding is yeah. not, not not like it used to be or this well, is like not like it used to be but maybe it's because you're not because because you're not in it you know that it's not you know that it's not like that maybe if you were the same age growing up and wanting to be like that maybe it is but I don't know I just yeah, it's, it's totally. interesting I mean I think just for clarity uh you know it was just like I think it was more like they're just the events and then the More amount events. of people participating is yeah. I guess what I would like lean on my experience as. And you know, it's just at time is it's life is ever changing, of course. And to a kid coming up now, they don't know any different. And it probably seems so exciting and so fresh because it is to them. And um, I mean, that being said, there's for sure kids that are coming up here now that are going to be much better than I am at this point, because, you know, they have that advantage of like, just like I did as a kid of seeing like, okay, this is the level. 
And as a kid, you don't know any better. You just assume that's the level you have to be at. You know, there's no like kind of breaking through barriers to get to a certain point. And, you know, someday for those kids, I believe it's going to be the same thing. The next generation is going to eclipse them. And I think that's the healthiest um, way to look at a sport is if it's really surviving is if there's always somebody that's getting better and faster just means there's a lot of interest in it still. But I mean, the, just to clarify before we used to have all these pat prone paddleboard events. Um, I guess we didn't uh, have like the, um, the big wave of like the paddling event, but there was that one toe event one year, but then you had the king of the air, you had all these windsurfing events and there was just a lot of like, I don't know. It just seems like nah. there was a lot of energy towards yeah. it. Yeah. I know what you mean. Like, look, you know, like with the stand up racing that we used to do, you know, like there's no doubt about it that, seven to eight years ago it was crazy you could be a professional stand-up paddle and make good money and the battle of the paddle and all that stuff was just like crazy crowds and you know money and sponsors and this and that and you look now and you're like it's just uh, vaporized you know and yeah and it's it's sort of sad it's very sad because like gosh you know but then it has me thinking like you have an event like molokai to oahu and you have the same like core people and it's almost in the last couple of years, seen a more of a resurgence of um, prone paddleboarding. Like there was yeah. an era where there was like prone paddleboarding didn't exist like it used to when you were racing and it was more stand up paddle focused. And then stand up paddling kind of waned a little bit and, you know, it was kind of replaced by the foil. But again, the foil didn't totally take away like the same way because there's only five of us or six of us doing it. And, uh, but then the prone community, it seemed like there was more. So it was like almost like back to its like grassroots underground vibe, you know, like everyone there was competitive with each other and probably couldn't care less what like somebody outside of the sport thought it was like, everyone was competing against each other. And that just reminded me of when I was a kid doing like a team relay of that race. And that was the years you were dominating and winning all of them. But it's just like, it's funny how things sort of go into a cycle. So I'm interested to see if things will go into a cycle again with like the whole wind sports, but I think we're living in unprecedented times and people's focus are probably a lot less on, you know, what we were focusing on like these sports. But then again, with COVID, it seems like there's more people getting outdoors. So who knows yeah. really? <laughs> yeah. And just before I blow past the, who, who is like, let's speak of the young kids up and comers. Cause yeah, you know, I know. Um, I've been seeing a lot of that young Annie Star. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, she seems like she's becoming a really well-rounded water woman. Uh, yep. You know, and shout, you know, give a shout out to any of the kids on Maui. Who are who are the kids that are impressing you these days? Like, sort of in that that you know, wind sport slash you know, big wave realm that are trying to be the complete waterman. Well, you know what? It's really cool to see um, that. And before I even like start dropping names is a lot of these kids now um, are very interested in doing multiple sports. And it's not for any other reason that they're just trying to occupy their time uh, being in the water with each other. And so it's really cool to see. I would say there's a more diverse crew of kids now than when I was coming up doing more sports. And a, a lot of it has to do with accessibility and these sports already existing. But I mean, like Annie Reichardt, her middle name's Star. It's like a family name. Ah, uh, that's right, yeah. And but but she goes by Annie Star. It's perfect because uh, she's probably going to be a Water Woman star one day. It's just cool to see her progression as well. Like she's really focused on um, getting her surfing dialed, but she wings every single day. She's learning how to kite. Um, obviously, she has great interest in big wave surfing. And you know, then of course Ty Simpson Kane, who got into the big wave event um, at Peahi. You know, the one thing I do love about having a big wave event here, or just any event in general, that's like on a professional scale is it really motivates the kids in the community here to like reach for something. They're not stuck on this Island thinking like, all right, like one day I can leave the Island to go do this event somewhere. It's like very accessible, tangible, and their family could be there. So like a kid like Ty, you know, he's going to be one of the best jaws surfers for sure. Give him time. And he's already had the advantage of like being around the best guys and getting into an event and, for me, when I got into an event out there, it really motivated me and brought clarity to, as to what I would have to do to be on that level. Like it was just like being a part of that that um, realm versus I'm trying to imagine it. And so you have those two, I would say they're kind of like not they're not the older crowd now, but they're like getting towards, you know, 17, 18 years old. Um, 
and uh and then you have like this super young crew and there's like funny there's a pack of girls over here like maybe like eight or ten girls that all want to surf jobs but they're still like 11 12 years old and it's oh just so God. funny <laughs> to see them go surfing and you'll surf with them and if you're not paying attention they'll hustle you like if yeah. it's your turn and you're not paying attention they're gonna paddle around and go because they're like they're tunnel vision i have a focus i want to get better at surfing and they're all getting into the wind sports as well but it's just funny because every time I like question them, like I talk to them, I'm like, well, do you ever want to surf Jaws one day? Like just out of curiosity, they're like, yeah, we cannot wait. As soon as our parents will let us, we're going out there. And I'm like, you know, they're surfing really good. They'll be able to do it when the time comes. Like they will yeah. be knifing into these waves and there could be like in who knows how long, five, 10 years from now, pack of 10 young girls just charging and um, embarrassing a lot of the boys, but, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of the kids that come down and, you know, through the summer have been doing a lot of downwinders and winging and stuff. Um, this kid, Otis Buckingham, he's like an up and coming kid. Um, there's another, uh, there's another bunch of kids, uh, nicknamed gnarly Marley. Uh, Marley, uh, is this like super young kid. He looks like he's maybe 10, but he's like 13, 14 now. And it's just fun to see all these kids that are like, definitely going to be you know on that front line of big wave riding one day and it's not like they're only focused on big wave riding they're doing like a million other different sports and it's not like they're only into foiling either they're doing like prone downwinders stand-up downwinders it's really cool and i like hanging out with them because it just brings me back to why you would do it it's just yeah. to entertain and have fun yeah the, the grom stoke just keeps the fire burning yeah for sure and and what's that? So what age were you, Kai, when, like, when, you know, I know you, you know, for, forever you can remember you've been down the beach and, you know, you started, I know you've, you've done all the sports, started at a super young age and got really proficient really early. But when was it that it really clicked for you? Was there a moment like where you got to meet Laird for the first time or Dave or Robbie? Because I, I know, you know, you were sponsored by Nash for the longest time and Robbie's like a, one of the most underrated watermen of all time, I believe, you know, and, and obviously he was a massive, massive influence on you. Um, and Dave, well, Dave's just such a legend, you know I mean? Dave's yeah. accessible to everyone, you know, he's, he's so willing, such a great coach and mentor, you know, and then you've got Laird who's the alpha male, you know, and, and, um, but obviously you just go, Oh my God, it's Laird. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, that's Led Hamilton, you know, like, yeah, and you totally. had all, and, and Rush Randall, who's the most, who's super gnarly, yeah. super, super gnarly underrated waterman. He's on, he lives out here in the North Shore. I see him every now and then. I mean, that guy's supremely talented that, and a lot of people wouldn't even know who that guy was. So, um, I mean, what, a, you know, Brett Lickle, I mean, the list goes on. You had so many amazing people, but I just wondering if there was that one time where you just, went home and just went, you know what? I want to be like these guys, like just from a certain moment in time. You know, I think it was really when I was just a tiny, tiny little kid. I mean, growing up here on the North shore of Maui, those guys were all here and my parents knew them. And so I, it was like kind of meeting your superhero, you know, like as if Superman existed or the whole justice league of superheroes were, uh, we're here. And to me, back in the day, it's funny because like nowadays, you know, you have this comic book um, film rave where people are, you know, kids really are inspired by these comic book characters. But to me, these guys were comic book characters. Like for me, what they were doing seemed unreal. Um, like it didn't seem like anybody could do it. Uh, and and I thought maybe I could do it because I like know them. <laughs> and hmm. by knowing them, it was really just like, occasionally they'd say hi to me at the beach sort of thing um but then you know i think when i did get older and i i was showing like a progression those guys were very genuine and very cool and um you know i would say open to sharing um their knowledge and stuff uh i definitely think i remember it being more than maybe it even was but that was just the impact that one person could have on a impressionable little kid is like one moment could stick with them and it could just kind of send them down a path of, you know, that never existed before that moment. Um, but, you know, I would say one of the most defining moments for me was just, I guess, being introduced to truly big waves was with Dave and Laird. And it was when Dave called me at 16 years old and told me that they were going to go foil out at Jaws. 
It wasn't a big day by any means. It might've been 12, 15 feet, but still bigger waves than I'd ever even dared go out to. And, you know, I had such a high level of respect for those guys that I was waiting for a moment that they said it was okay to go out. Like I wouldn't dare go out there on my own and try to catch a wave if it wasn't with their permission. Um, and I think that was like the right thing to do. And in hindsight, I just remember them saying, you know, what do you want to do? Go out there for two years or do you want to go out there for 30? And I kind of was always of the thought process that, you know, I'd rather be out there for a long time. And, you know, they always told me that, you know, the waves existed forever. It's going to exist long before or long after you're gone. So don't rush it. And that's when I would take those baby steps. But I guess really breaking down to like how those individuals influenced me today or have led me to that point. You know, I think starting with Dave, Dave is probably, he's still doing really awesome stuff. And, and he's, I would say, doesn't care what anybody thinks about it. He'll occasionally share it on social media, but it's just the ultimate program. I think you would want to be when you get to that age is he, he, you know, he's a, sorry, for, sorry for cutting you off but he's the ultimate grommet like oh, i mean yeah. there's, there's no bigger frother than dave like he's just like he'll find a way to f make things cut things slice them and dice them and they might look kooky or whatever but he don't give a shit and he's having more fun than anyone yeah you know and usually it the first versions of those toys <laughs> he's working on look, are very unrefined but like then, the paddles <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, but you know, he's always he's always into the functionality. I think it's yeah. less about maybe the style of it and the functionality. And I mean, you know, if you look back at the history of his influence on surfing, uh, people 10, 20 years later all start copying what him and others were doing. Uh, and so I think Dave is like, I feel like Dave isn't as revered as a Hawaiian waterman as he should be because. He's probably one of the greatest watermen of Hawaiian lineage that has ever existed I, compared to anybody. I mean, two foot to a hundred foot, you know, in his time, he was, you know, I think underrated. And then, you know, you have like, I think somebody like Laird who he had such an influence because he was this, he was like Superman. He had this aura around him and he also, you know, kind of like without doing maybe the most high performance maneuvers he commanded a lot of respect when he rode a big wave. Like it just looked like he was a part of it. Like it was, and when he, he was doing these incredible turns and stuff, but I feel like it was a lot had to do with the way he approached it. The energy he put out into the, the world was like, um, he just seemed like that's what a big wave surfer would look like if one was made for big wave surfing, yeah. <laughs> you know? And um, and then between him and Dave and the whole strap crew, those guys were constantly looking at ways to entertain themselves and innovate. And I mean, they were riding foils 20 years before foils became what it is today, which is like I can't, a more common practice. And then, you know, I think one of the most underrated dudes of all time for sure is Rush. I mean, he was doing maneuvers with straps that I'm just trying to replicate and, you know, I think the one tragedy of the whole strapped crew uh, is that they kind of existed in an era where there wasn't social media and they had to make their own movies and put it out, but they didn't, the, all the stuff they were doing, you couldn't put into like one video. Like it was a daily thing with those guys. And with Rush, you know, he was probably doing aerial maneuvers that are only just being done now. Um, and still like you go to the North shore and the guy will throw a 720 every time you know, he'll do it with straps, but he'll do it inverted. He was closer to snowboarding on a surfboard than, you know, just doing normal tricks. Uh, so Rush is somebody nowadays, especially that I try to find any shred of footage on the internet to like be inspired by. And then of course, Robbie, Robbie Nash, like, again, he's one of the, like you said, one of the most underrated watermen of all time. Um, and he was a very huge support for me since he had a company that served so many sports like windsurfing, kiting, sup, uh, surfing, um, foils now uh, that he definitely was a huge reason why I kind of became who I am today. Uh, but I mean, then again, too, like I'm gonna bring it back to you, Jamie is like when you would show up here for prone paddleboarding, I could just remember it was like the legend came to town, like Jamie Mitchell, he won the Molokai like eight times at that point, And he was going to like, probably when until he quits and the <laughs> craziest story I think I ever heard was when 
um, your board flew off the top of a roof and it broke in like three pieces. And then, and, and you still won the, on that board, like three more Molokai titles. And it's like, what? That yeah. no one can do that. It's Michael that was, Phelps crap. That was, that was Dave, Dave gave me his little car. And uh, we were driving, and I had three 18-foot boards on the roof of his little white Toyota Echo, I think it was. And we're driving down Hana Highway, and it was a windy day. And I'm driving, 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 and I'm going past this, like, semi-trailer, and I hear this, oh. and I look at and I look in the rear vision mirror, and I see the, not, the, not just the boards, the roof racks still attached to the boards, and they're floating in slow motion across the – the highway missing cars and somehow just land on the on the side of the road. <laughs> it's just like, oh my god! Like I'm, I'm lucky I'm not in jail. Number one, because I didn't kill someone from the boards going into someone's like windscreen. Yeah. And then, uh, long story short, we took him to Mark Mark um, Rapos, Ding King. He fixed it. I wrote it that year, and I, that board was my magic board. I, and I kept writing, and I think I wrote it for another two years after it flew off the roof. You know, but uh. But I think that's a, look, the beauty of that story and what you was like, I, I had the same, like they had Laird and Dave and the strap crew, like gave me the hope of like, the, there was something to do that wasn't just straight surfing or straight paddling or straight anything, you know, cause, cause I, I lived in Australia and, and the word waterman, even though there's some amazing like Waterman in Australia, of course, you know, but there wasn't an avenue for anyone to like, I did surf club. I swam. I did the Ironman. Like those guys are amazing. Like, you know, Paulie and, and all those guys, like they're incredible athletes. Matt Bevelacqua, who's won the last couple of Molokai's, you know, like, but you know, like for me, I love surfing and, and I love paddling and, and everything else. And I, and I would just, I remember getting the lead VHS tape, and the strap VHS tape. And I just, I mean, my roommate hated me. I just watched those movies over and over and over and over. I mean, I remember watching them with you at your house 10 years ago. I mean, it just, I just was obsessed. I was obsessed with those guys. I wanted to be those guys. And, and, and in a way, that's such an amazing thing because you, when, you, when people say that you can nearly manifest like your reality and manifest your dreams. Like, like I feel I did, like I was this nobody from Australia that came to Hawaii to do a paddleboard race and, and became really, really good friends with Dave. And I remember being on a photo shoot in San Francisco with Dave and I'm like, Hey, you want to go surf Mavericks? Like Mavericks is on, like there's a swell come. He's like, don't you just paddle? <laughs> like he didn't even know I surfed, you know what I mean? Like, and it was just, and anyway, like that, I, I remember getting a phone call too one day. I'm like, hey, I want to go to Jaws. I want to go to Jaws. Please, like, I'll drive a jet ski, whatever. I don't even care if I have to surf, you know. And I remember one day being on the North Shore and uh, and I get a phone call and he's like, hey, your time, your number just came up. I'm like, what? He's like, get over here. And I was just like, yes. Like, I was just so psyched. I was like a little kid, man. It was like your ultimate heroes have just invited you to come along, you know, and and – I think that's the beauty of what you're doing. I think that these kids get to see their hero and anyone that's a hero in their life and they see a good role model and they're like, I can be like this. I can, I, or, and even if you don't, you can strive to be the best that you can be, whether or not it's as yeah. good as Kai Lenny or Led Hamilton or Dave Klein, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, but you, you set yourself goals, you strive to just get better, you know, be a better person, healthy lifestyle training, you know, and uh, it's, 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 it's such amazing to have those people for you getting back to like, you know, your progression of starting as a kid to, to where you are now. I absolutely agree with you, Jamie. And I think trying to compare yourself or like beat other people is honestly pretty overrated. And that's something that I've just continued to learn as I've gotten older is just like, you know, it's about setting your own personal goals and trying to achieve them. And it's really that journey of trying to get to that point. And I think it's really great when you could be inspired by somebody. And like, you know, we were inspired by the Strap crew. Uh, you know, for me, it's like, what can you continue to be inspired by? And if, you, if, if you're able to always have a goal in front of you, you're going to be able to live a full life and 
by the end of it, be pretty satisfied with your experience. Because again, like being considered better than somebody else, it might feel good on the surface, but it's not something that lives with you when you really go home, you know, you're kind of back into your own world. And that's what I'm liking a lot about these young kids too, is they're very humble. And, and I think they're, they're all supporting one another too, you know, like there was an era when I was competing in like stand up paddling and all that, where it's just like, you would just want to beat your friends so bad. You're, it almost ruined your friendship. And I think a lot has changed with me. Like just in real example of big waves is that was a rivalry was really forming between me and Lucas. He's a good foot. I'm a regular similar in age. And we both like to tow, both like to paddle. And, you know, inevitably we ended up just teaming up and I couldn't be more stoked when I just tow him into a giant wave and he can't be more stoked when he tows me into a giant wave. Uh, and then when we're paddling, you know, it's like that having somebody that could really push you beyond your limits, you really do need somebody like that. I think mm -hmm. in your life, like in some ways I've thought, Oh, how much easier would it be if all these little rivalries in these sports, if those persons just didn't exist at that time or if I was, two years earlier. And then I think, well, I wouldn't be as good as I am today. If you didn't, if I didn't have like somebody that I thought was way better because I would want to try to rise to that. But I think there's a way to do that where you could like kind of just be inspired and, you know, not let the ego get in the way. And that's usually the most detrimental part is when you yeah. kind of let it stop you. Yeah. That's, that's just maturity, you know, for sure. Just being older. And it's a, it's a good point because you, you are, you know, you are, obviously very talented, very lucky, had a ton of sponsors, right? And, and you, when you would tow, it was, you would have specific guys that were able to tow you, you know, like you would turn up and it was, you know, Victor or Double D or whoever it may be, you know, cause obviously you like to get a lot of waves and you can surf yep. all day, you're fit, you know, like, so that's a, it's a really cool transition into actually like teaming up with Lucas, you know, because now you guys are, potentially like a team, like, you know, like in reality, that's what teams were always used to be like, you know, like Dave and Led, like they would go and maybe Dave would get the wave of the day that day. And maybe Led would get it the next day, you know, because it's, it's 50, 50, you, you don't know, you know, but, but you seem like for a while they had it on tap where you could just sort of just go all day, go all day, go all day. But what's it been like to actually sort of take a step back and, and, like be like going, oh my God, like I'd like to be surfing right now, but now I've got to drive Lucas, you know what I mean? Like, has it been fun? Has it been frustrating a little bit? But, and like mm. you're saying, just maturing and like going, you know what? Like I don't need to so-called be the man every time and get the best wave, although we all want that, but it's fun to get your guy the best wave because I saw how stoked he was when he got you that right at Nazareth. Yeah. Oh, totally. You know, it was like, I think the difference is now it's like, it's really about sharing the experience is kind of what makes those certain sessions really the most um, powerful. Uh, for sure, like, I want to ride as many waves as I possibly can. But I think what I did learn is that, in like, I could get away with riding a little bit less, but I'll push harder on those fewer waves. And there is something nice about just taking a step back and going on the ski and towing a psycho in like Lucas, because this guy is just like, full tilt, pedal to the metal and I and I'll watch him and he'll just get me so fired up that when I get back on the rope it's not like I go through that moment of feeling kind of flat because if you do go all day it's you can do an endurance race like that but a lot of times there, there will be a lot of rides where you're just kind of riding as a ghost you know you're kind of just going through the motions and I think you're not picking it apart because that opportunity is so accessible and you know really it came about because of the Nazare challenge and us towing together we started practicing on swells before towing one another. And I just found that my performance was just getting better. And he was agreeing with me at the same way. It's like we were both pushing each other because we were allowing each other to get each other on the best waves. And then we'd watch intently and see what the guy was doing. He'd be like, oh, that was insane. And then we would swap and it would be like, okay, I got to push it farther now. And in some ways, I think we were inspiring one another. And we would spend all day in the water, maybe half the time, I guess, on the uh, the rope. But most of the time, it was like, I think it was more focused time surfing. Uh, and yeah. I think that was like better. And, you know, to be honest, too, it's like, like you said, it's a lot of luck who gets the best wave. And I've never when it's so satisfying driving somebody, even if he's like your greatest rival in your head, 
trying to get them on the best waves is like your only goal at the moment. And there's something almost more satisfying in getting somebody who really wants it a crazy wave than actually riding the wave yourself. And, um, you know, when he got me that big right during the contest, like he had towed me into an earlier wave and we were towing back out and that wave just sort of appeared and it was mm. underneath everybody. And it was like, all right, like, let's go. And then he, we were, we were kind of having this conversation for a couple of seconds. Like, should we go? Should we not go? It's in a weird spot. I don't know. And like, ah, oh, just go anyway. And then, you know, I guess like through that experience, I just really knew what a good guy he was because he was genuinely stoked for me that I got that wave. And ever since then, I've been trying to pay him back with getting him the best possible biggest wave as I could. And, you know, I was stoked to see this last giant swell that he got one of the best lefts, maybe the best hollowest left um, of the day, because it was just like, yes, like, you know, I'm stoked that that one came for you because there was a lot of times where I'd be towing him and it just seemed like the waves weren't coming to us like they would when I was on the rope. It was yeah. just maybe the timing. And I was like, I was trying my best, like, all right, where's like trying to get you on the biggest wave barreling wave possible. And, you know, it's good to see when it, it, it comes together for your friend. Yeah, for sure. And uh, it, there is something about driving that's super fun and you learn a lot too. And I feel like, with, without toe surfing being so popular the last, say, decade, I feel like a lot of the skills on driving a jet ski from some big wave surfers probably have just been lost in translation. You know, you know, with towing a partner, you got to learn how to go in, do the pickups and all that sort of stuff, you know. And uh, with the paddle revolution coming through so fast, like everyone was just paddling and there'd be specific guys doing rescue, you know. So it's yeah. sort of nice. It's sort of nice when, you know, if, if you go out there, you should probably know how to drive a jet ski, in my opinion, you know, like in case something happens. Yeah, it just seemed like there was that, um, you know, the the rebirth of paddle and surfing or that resurgence where it was like paddle, 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 everything. Like, where are the limits? And there was like no limits for the longest time. Uh, and then, you know, I think toe and surfing really, like we saw, kind of disappeared. But then it was like there was a little rebirth with toe surfing at, say, Nazare because it was a place that, required toe surfing to in order to ride the biggest days and then when paddling ended up going there i think we were seeing kind of like a merging of two disciplines within big wave riding and now it's i'm i'm thinking more in the future that it's going to be a little bit heavier uh condition based because you have guys like you know lucas chumbo who uh you know wants to do it all he really doesn't care if he's paddling or towing it's just condition dependent and yeah. I'm on the same boat with him. Like, if it's great paddling, frick, let's paddle because there's a huge challenge there. If it's good towing, let's just go tow. And, you know, maybe the wind comes up and it you you, you end up towing because of the wind. But um, I think Nazare was in – it kind of – Nazare kind of came in at the right time. And just thinking back on all the greatest moments in big wave surfing from the day, you know, Greg Knoll caught his crazy wave at Makaha, it's pretty interesting to see when things – whenever these transitional moments they happen at the right time somehow and it was like Shane catching his wave at um you know Jaws and then it was like kind of exploring the biggest waves possible with you and Twiggy at uh you know Belhara and then it was like the paddling contest out at Nazare and it was Garrett towing into a giant wave and it was the slab era of people towing into chopes and that was like all what it was all about it's just really interesting like there's so much you know, I was riding giants came out in like 2003 or something, 2004. And just since then, there's probably just as much as happened since that over that entire document or over that 50 year period that that movie was based on. And it just seems like things continue to accelerate forward. So who knows where we're going to end up in 10 years. It's going to be exciting just to see. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so c continuing on the path, um, so you did you homeschool as a kid? Did you go to school? Were you homeschooled or? I did online school um, yeah. from high school on, but oh, yeah. up until like eighth grade in in America, I was like at normal school. And um, actually, some of my best friendships here on Maui kind of were forging that. And I think you know, for a long time, I kind of like contemplated whether it was like the right thing to do um, to like not go to normal school because you miss out on, I guess that. Um, era of like development as a kid and meeting people and kind of going through like I guess the norms of a human being or what a human being should like there's a reason 
more than just the studying, but like the yeah. social aspect. And it was all a willing sacrifice to end up where I am today. And the reason why I had to do it was because it was during a time where the schools on my wouldn't even allow me to travel like a week out of the entire year. And had they been a little more lenient like they are now, because I think they see the successes of pro athletes from the island, um, I think I could have gone and done both. But it's good to see, like, I'm actually pretty stoked when I see these young kids that are still doing school and then they're able to still travel. Like, they kind of have the best of both worlds. And I think that's really awesome. Um, but, you know, like, for the majority of when I was through high school, I was traveling nine months of the year. And it was uh, the best experience ever. And in hindsight, I wouldn't want to change a thing because a lot of my good friends were met on the road. And now I feel like I have a network of people around the globe that I could call at any point in time when I'm traveling and, you know, have a hot meal and a warm bed if I really needed one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what age was it, Kai? Then you like really, you know, when you started to get sponsorship that were, you know, obviously that you're like, wow, this is this is real now, you know, I'm getting paid some money. Um, you know, this is really going to be my, be my path. And you are really going to put everything into it. Like you must've sort of seen that in your teenage years, right? Cause you were sponsored by yeah, quick, quick, quick silver way back then. I remember when I met you and you were doing the paddleboard races, you were sponsored by quick silver. Yeah. I, I mean, totally. I, I remember, I mean, as a kid, I just didn't even care if I had anything but stickers on my board, <laughs> like any yeah. little kid would, you just wanted to mirror your idols and, Dave Kalama was uh, pretty, he was, he was the one that kind of hooked me up with Quicksilver in the beginning. And then Robbie Nash kind of like solidified that a little bit later on. Um, but with Nash was probably my first true big sponsor. And that was at nine years old. Um, and then again, too, I think I was like a product of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, it was just like during an era where kite surfing was just blowing up and I had ended up getting sponsored by kite surfing through my windsurfing and through kiting of course and it was because red bull had an event here called the king of the air mm -hmm. and it was like the early early years and the way i got hooked up with them was actually when i was 12 years old and i think it was because i was probably the only or one of the only young windsurfing kids um who was sponsored by nash had quicksilver logo on um through dave and you know i also was like one of the early kite kids and so it was just like being in the right place at the right time and in a way, knowing the right people or having the right people on have uh, on my back, you know, like, hey, like this kid's really cool, you know, and like he's going to be good one day. Uh, that was, I think, mainly one of the reasons why I got pretty locked in. And then, you know, I just always made sure when I was sponsored to over deliver, like anything they requested, I tried to do twice as much. And being kind of an alternative surf athlete, I always felt like I had to over deliver because my strengths weren't ever in shortboarding small waves and competing in that yeah. competition side. It was like, you know, competing in other sports, but it wasn't, you know, and I think a lot of these other sponsors like a Quicksilver were still at that era more er, very interested because of the influences of Dave and then influences of yourself who were on the Quicksilver team um, had. Uh, and then, so I think there was, I think it's hard for kids to necessarily get sponsored now um, just mm. because it's, you know, like you have to kind of fit into a box a little more, but I was, I kind of arrived when there wasn't necessarily yeah. a box in my arena or what I did. Yeah. Timing's everything sometimes, you know, and uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a good time. So when did you, when did you fall in love with sort of the, you know, cause we're going to get to the life of Kai real soon. So, and you, your life has been well documented, but when, when did you sort of take a liking to, to like, you know, carrying a camera, you know, making sure that everything was being filmed and you're getting clips and, and that, when did that really kick in for you? Because like, you've been doing it for a long time. Yes. Uh, uh, well, it's interesting. So my deal with Red Bull when I was 12 is I wouldn't, I wasn't getting paid, but I got given a HD camera. And the part of my deal was like, they wanted to create a database of me as a kid growing up basically. So that one day when I was maybe 18 or 19, that there would be an archive. And so they basically would like, I guess, support me on my trips and like on equipment and all that by buying back my footage that, you know, I filmed. And so I got really into filming that way. And then also I just have always been into like film as well. Like I love filmmaking, just like, 
storytelling. I mean, there's nothing better than when you can sit down with somebody and hear an amazing story. And I've always been a visual learner. So seeing something visually always caught my eye and combining storytelling with, you know, visuals was always very enticing. And then for me too, is like, I feel like if I always wanted to sort of share how I did things, but while I shared how I did them, um, you know, have people just like see the good, the bad and whatever. And, you know, I feel like a lot of times it's always been positive and it's because a lot of the projects I've done haven't necessarily been in control. And I'm like, well, you know, with the life of Kai series, I do want to show kind of like that mental struggle a little bit with like, you know, how I transitioned from the beginning of the season to the end. And it was all through just changing a mindset and, you know, not necessarily winning something that I could have won, uh, not necessarily getting the wave of the day, but not letting it be my hang up. And then, you know, instead of being kind of like separated or my, I guess when you were younger and competing, you didn't want to like give away all your cards, you know, not like necessarily hanging out with your peers as much. It kind of flipped it to the end of the season where I'm like with one of my rivals, Lucas, and we become best friends and we're just excited to see each other push it. And, and inevitably you end up getting what you want that way better because you're not, you're not like trying to control anything. You're just letting things happen as they come. And that hard work sort of pays off uh, because, you know, you've let go. And I always remember Kelly Slater's movie, letting go. As soon as you let go of like having all control, usually things start to work out the way you envision them. And so I've been trying to kind of like do whatever I can to do the best I possibly can. And if it works out great, but if it's not, I'm just going to keep chugging on forward. Yeah, because I remember um, back when you were heavily in the stand-up racing, you had the series Positively Kai, right? That was one mm-hmm. that, you, that you did. Yeah. And then you've done the SUP movie. I think that's what it was called, right? You did mm-hmm. the SUP movie, which was you know all about your stand-up surfing, racing, big waves. And and then um, I'm going to butcher this. Is it par- Paradigm Lost? Is that how yes. you Yes, pre- nailed it. I nailed it. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, and that was sort of like a – a little bit of a feature film as well, uh, and then you've got your. Uh, I, I love the I love the name of Twenty at Twenty. That's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, uh, very few people understood that, but I was like, anybody that knows knows what that means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah that... I was always thinking if I did that vlog, I wanted to end it. If I was going to end it, it would have to be on a Twenty at Twenty swell. Yeah, and then you know, kind of took a break from it just now for the Life of Kai series, but <laughs> yeah. And so how does, so how now, so how take it, take all those little projects you've done, you know, the positively Kai and, and the movies that you've done. And, and now obviously it seems like, you know, Red Bull's got right behind this, uh, the life of Kai series and, um, uh, se- season one. So I'm guessing there's going to be multiple seasons. Um, yeah, fortunately. Yes. <laughs> what have you learned? <laughs> like, what, what, what did you learn? Like, what, what did you take out of all those other projects and, you know, because, you know, I, I think it's for me personally, like if I'm watching your, like, I, I want to see a, a bit of the struggle, like the, the Kai Lenny thing is very, it seems very perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, totally. It's, it's, it's like Kai's sponsored since he's 10. He's got everything given, I'm not saying given to him, but you've worked your ass off, but you know, but in it a, looks like it for when, sure. When you look at it, it looks like, oh, this, you know, some, someone might go, fuck man, this guy's, perfect i don't want to care anymore you know what i mean but yeah totally. so so for me it's been good to see a little bit of um the struggle you know and just a little bit different side of kyle lenny you know because I, again i think as kids growing up you you we all know that nothing's perfect no one's perfect yeah. nothing's perfect life's not perfect we all have our struggles so i think it's good that um you know you've matured enough you're at an age where you're like hey i can start to I can start to show more of myself. I can start to show more of my personality maybe and just what life is in general for you, you know, because um, I think that's important, you know? Yeah, I agree. Totally. And a lot of these projects too, when they did come up, it was ways just to like get my name out and, um, you know, I guess share what I'm doing. And the only way, the only things I knew how to share were what I was doing. And of course you'd want to make yourself look the best way possible. And, yeah. you know, sometimes I think God's uh, like, you know, if we're doing a project, a lot of times if either directors or people that are producing it don't know me, they want to do the same, like, oh, the beginning. And because they're like, they, they're maybe not a part of that world as much. And I'm like, gosh, I just feel like it's been rehashed so much. I'm like bored of talking about it. 
I want to show like what's happening now. And I want to just show like how I'm changing um, through these experiences, because one of the biggest concerns I had when I was a kid coming up was like that transition from being, I guess, a child star to like, you know, a top level professional athlete, but one that's like could last the, the length of time, like the people that are in their 50s that are still doing their thing and still revered as great athletes. That's always my goal. And so I thought on this series and I tried to incorporate it the best I could. Um, and I thought the people that I worked with at Indig Indigenous Films and Red Bull Media House, they they pulled it together was just like, you know what, just like show how it was like not always super psyched and like how there's like kind of, you know, the hurry up and wait gets under my nerves or, yeah. you know, just like anything that anybody would normally go through. And I guess my hope is in the future is to continue having these stories of myself. If there's a lesson in there that somebody can learn to like avoid, cause I'm just figuring out as I go as well. It's like, Oh, like if I'm going on this kind of path that Kai has been on, you know, here's some clear signs of like where, you know, you can avoid a little bit of trouble and then you could like, you know, go as far as you can. And then eventually I think as an individuals, we always come into our own um, speed bumps for sure. Uh, but it's just how you overcome it. And so, no, I mean, like a lot of these projects, I just love filmmaking. I love being around the camera because it's like capturing cool things gets me excited. It's not necessarily capturing me, but it, the easiest way to capture anything would be around me because I could be like, oh, I could do this and we could get it on film and it might look really cool. Uh, and then, and then again, too, it's like, it's, it's just getting my name out there. And in a way, you know, like being a professional athlete, it's a little bit like survival. You're always having to try to figure out how to make yourself relevant yeah. and you can either do it through competition, but you know, in the COVID era, competition doesn't really exist. So it's like, how do you, how do you get to do what you get to do? And in a perfect world, all I would want to do is just go out and do what I'm doing and could care less about mess, maybe capturing it. But I do enjoy, you know, people talking to me about it and a lot of people have some great ideas for stuff that I'm doing so that's good yeah yeah it's amazing and uh so what you know where where is big wave surfing headed in your opinion Kai I mean you're at the forefront of it guys like you and Lucas and you know there's a bunch of other um people but where what's in your mind where where do you see it in the next five years uh you know I think we're kind of on a trajectory um with where it's just like progress very progression based i think the limits of like how big of a wave you can paddle in you know like i, I think everyone's gonna be trying to still catch the biggest waves that are paddled in but i think we're limited by those days um you don't always get that that perfect opportunity and who knows if i'll see a day like that aaron gold 2016 swell that we were a part of like you know you just never know um you'd like to think so but how soon that's anyone's guess for me, my personal vision, and I think it's in line with Lucas since I've been towing with him, is we just want to do is high performance things on big waves. And I think with paddling, it might mean riding, starting to ride smaller and smaller boards. And someone like Albi Lair has already been pushing that for many years. But it's like, you know, the risk goes up when you have to ride a smaller board and you have to sit farther inside. And can you catch as big of a wave? Sure. You just got to be farther inside and you might just pay the ultimate price for it. So I, I envision like my paddle and surfing being more turn maneuvers, longer barrels, of course, and just trying to ride bigger waves. And um, and then when it comes to toe and surfing, I just want to do snowboarding style maneuvers on big waves. I, you know, catching the biggest wave ever ridden, that's cool. Like if I could catch one of those and that's why I go to like a place like Nazare or I'm on call with Jaws, but it's not my motivation for big wave surfing. I'd rather just catch a bunch of big waves, but do really like, scary big maneuvers that you know keep the adrenaline flowing and if i kick out and i don't do like say even a simple 360 i'd find myself maybe disappointed only because that's what i've sort of set myself up as success in my path you know and i think everyone has a different approach in big wave riding and a lot of times like i just get inspired by it. i'm like gosh the way that person's sitting over there to paddle into this wave that's like that's cool you know i want to do that or the way they're just drawing a line on a big wave. Yeah. I don't think it'll ever, you know, on some of the biggest, baddest waves, all you're going to be able to do is ride it the best way possible. It's going to be like dropping in and setting yourself up and getting in the barrel, similar to like what 
um, Shane has done, um, you know, what Ian Walsh has done, what yourself has done. Like, you know, there are certain waves. There's just, you can't do anything more than you're probably already doing unless yeah. you were towed in. But uh, I don't know. I just want to ride a ton of big waves. Um, that's the progression I see though, is yeah. like for me. Yeah, that's cool. It's awesome. And then I, I, I love the way that the, the promo was cut for the life of Kai, that, that question that you, and the way that you answer it. Like, so, so what is the goal? And you are really like, you know, focus and into the, into the camera is like, well, it's to be the, the best big wave rider ever, you know? And yeah. was that, was that something to just like, seem very poignant to like put that out there as the first thing, you know? And is that something that you feel like you, the, the, that holds you accountable, like to, to make you focus, you know, now that it's out there that you've just said that, you know, or is it just something that you, you drive deep within? That's just, that's just what I want to do. And I'm going to do everything it takes to, to do it. You know? Well, you know, I didn't even know they were going to put that in the beginning. When I first thought I was like, Oh gosh, like I just remember in that interview, which was just right here in my boardroom, you know, for me, I always wanted to be the best big wave rider. I wanted yeah. to be, because I watched Laird and I watched Dave and I watched Rush and all these, the strap crew. And I figured, you know, when their time was up, I wanted to be them. And so I, I, and part of the way of being honest in a show, I feel like, you know, I could have shown like maybe more humility where I've been like, well, I just want to be one of the best big wave riders, but no, I mean, but, that was but always, that's, never that's, been my goal. That's, but that's what I'm coming, coming back to. That's like, that's what was real. Like you, you could have yeah. went, you could have totally. went back to the old Kai and said, For I could sure. be one, but, but you were open and honest and I like it. That's what I like about the life of Kai, you know, cause you, yeah, you're putting it out, you're putting it out there, you know, and, and, and you're not, being, it's not being cocky. It's just like, of course you want to be the best. If you asked me well, 10 years ago about paddleboarding, yeah. it's like, of course I want to be the best, you know, like, am I going to be the yeah. best? Like, I don't know, but, Am I going to give it a hundred percent? Of course I'm going to, but you can, you can be very confident and cocky without being an asshole. You know what I mean? Like there's way, there's ways around. You can be super competitive. You can be the most competitive person in the world, but still shake someone's hand when they beat you. You know what I mean? There's ways, there's ways to go about it, to, um, to do that. And uh, I, I liked it. When I saw that, I was like, right on Kai. Like, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> that you come, you come out and said that. That was awesome. Well, too, it felt like something to get off the chest as well. It's just like, I mean, I thought about it and I'm like, well, how would people like interpret that? Like, oh, what a little dick, you know, like, why would, why would you like, you think you're better than everyone else? But then I thought about it, I'm like, you know, all the people that I get to surf with, they all want to do the same thing. Like I've, I promise if you asked, uh, you know, a lot of the other individuals in big wave surfing, of course they'd want to be the best, the best, the greatest. And, um, but I think what that allows us to do is just to like let go and, you know, give our the best hand. And if at the end of the day, if somebody's better, you know, at least I know I gave it my absolute all. And to be honest, I won't be the best I could possibly be if there weren't other people out there that wanted to be better than me or were better than me, in fact. So, uh, you know, I think like it was just. I think it's really good to state your intentions, um, especially in a world of a little bit of deception, you know, with social media, you can make yourself look however you want. Um, and I definitely feel like I show mostly the positive of what is going on. And that's like, just, I think with anybody's approach, but yeah, even in season two, like, I really just want to show, um, you know, who like, yeah, I'm not perfect by any means and I don't pretend to be, um, or I try to like be a lot more honest nowadays than I have ever been. So yeah, that, that question too, is just like, you know what? I I've always wanted to be, so yeah, this is the truth. Here I don't know if is. I ever will be, but this is it. <laughs> yeah. That's cool, man. That's, that's awesome. And, um, so just a couple last questions. So if you could tell, uh, the young kids coming up that, uh, you know, want to be the next Kyle Lenny, like what, what, what advice would you give them? What, what, what's a couple of pieces of, pieces of advice that you've learned along the way or that you didn't do or did do that you would give these kids to give them the, the best opportunity to, to, you know, to live their dream? Well, I think number one would be come talk to me immediately, just because if they had a specific question, I would love to like, you know, give them my insight. Cause I do, I, I really, every opportunity I get, and I, and I get it that like, 
there was people older than me and I tried to be very like observant and absorb whatever somebody said, but I do feel like, gosh, there's things I've learned that will like save you two years of trying to get better in big waves. But then I, now I understand too, you have to kind of go through stuff like as your own experience, like you need that time and experience to learn on your own to truly understand it. Like being told something doesn't really count, but I would say most importantly is don't take everything so seriously. Um, obviously take things seriously and, and, you know, be on time for, if you're going to have a meeting with a sponsor or just be on time in general with anything um, and then always over deliver. But, you know, I think most importantly, don't get like too focused. Like this is, this is your whole world. And I think when I was younger, I was too focused on trying to, to have control of making everything work. And um, I think it's, I think you're going to be able to go farther faster when you're able to separate the two, like, you know, like a light switch, you know, you go into competition, you go into that competition mode. And then afterwards you're able to basically let go of that ego and you could hang and you could be around the people you just compete against. And it's not a weakness to be like that. I think yeah. sometimes it could be perceived as that, but it's a strength because you're so strong. It doesn't matter what anybody could say to you. It wouldn't even affect you. And that's from just letting go and under, and being comfortable with yourself, kind of learning to love yourself since you're stuck with yourself the rest of this life. Um, you know, I think, and not being too overly analytical on um, everything that you do. You know, if you have a bad session, it's like, all right, I had a bad session. Like, I'll just yeah. go try again the next time. Whereas Sorry. before, like, sometimes I might get too wrapped up, like, I just blew that big wave session. I didn't go for that wave. I pulled back. And nowadays, if I pull back on a wave, I'm like, like, oh, maybe I could have gone, All right? The next opportunity, I'll, I'm will i going to just go for it. And then you go for it. But it's like, I think, yeah, that's, I would say that's my greatest advice is just to really like, let go a little bit more. Stay focused, of course, but um, try to just like, be a good person first, of course. <laughs> Well, you heard, you heard it, kids. When you see Kyle and me, run up and ask him a question. <laughs> yes. If I can help, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kyle, I'm going to fin fin finish up the podcast with uh, five to finish, five questions. And I, I, know, I probably know okay. a bunch, bunch of your answers already. But um, the best big wave in the world? Uh, for me, Jaws, it's <laughs> sure. just back door. And it's in my backyard. Yeah. I love all the other big waves, but if I had to choose one, Jaws. Yeah. yeah. Uh, heaviest slash scariest big wave in the world? Uh, you know, it's the scariest big wave to me is the one I haven't had the most experience at for sure. Um, just because that the, the unknown, um, it real quick, like Nazare, when I first did the first time I had ever gone was, uh, the first Nazare challenge, the paddle event. And I remember so, being so grateful. I lived through that cause it just seemed so crazy and out of control. And I thought I would never come back. Like, but I knew in my heart that I would. And now that I've spent enough seasons there, I've gotten more comfortable, though I still respect it immensely. It's typically the, the place that I have spent the least amount that scare, terrifies me because I haven't gone through it. But I mean, I guess getting caught inside at the peak at Jaws in a barreling 80 foot wave, I don't know. That one still is probably the hard, that's hard to beat. That one is, I've had nightmares over that. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Um, the most underrated big wave in the world? Uh, the most underrated big wave? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. That's, that's really hard. Um, I guess my mind's always been wrapped up in like the three big ones, which is like the Jaws and the Mavericks and the Nazare. Mm -hmm. Like if I was to like pick a triangle of waves to go to, I still think like maybe there's waves on the North Shore like Waimea Bay. You know, Waimea in some way has been forgotten as one of the gnarliest, but I just remembered when I was trying to get into the Eddie as an alternate and skipping out on a big Jaws day and watching massive Waimea close out and all you guys were out there just sending it and the skis had to come in. I'm like, dude, you know what? Like, Waimea is like super gnarly. And yeah. I knew personally when I went out in that morning trying to like maybe make a point that I should be in the event and I took off behind uh, Ian Walsh and I can remember being too late and purling and getting super, super pounded, like to the bottom, super deep ears ringing. And um, I think part of the reason why I got so pounded is because I was like, oh, no, I'm used to Jaws. It can't be as bad, you know? Yeah. And then I was like, frick, this way, pound for pound is still like 
I put it still on a top tier list of here. Yeah. So like that big, that big Waimea day, like, I don't think people like revere that wave as much as they should. <laughs> yeah. Good, good answer. Um, what's one big wave you haven't surfed yet that you want to surf? I really want to go and surf ship sterns. I really want to go down there and do that wave just because it's a right. Uh, there's a ledge so I can like do a chop hop down the wave. And then it's a big barrel, of course. The only thing is it's freezing and not knowing that wave very well is pretty scary. Um, and, you know, another wave is like, I guess, you know, it's always the waves that I haven't spent the most time at that I'm the most scared that I want to go to. And it's these slab waves. I haven't spent that much time on these huge slabs. So even like a chokes, I've been out there when it's 12 to 15 feet and paddling, but, you know, have gotten pounded a little bit by that. But I haven't been up there when it's like 25 foot toe and you just see these huge slab waves. I'm like, gosh, I got to like, I got to do it because I haven't done it. And yeah. I know I'll be terrified up to that point. But then by the end, I'll have been really, I'll, I'll either be dead or I'll have really loved it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think you really love ship stones. And I think that, um, you know, the guys like Mikey Brennan down there has always wanted to go over that, that step and then do that, you know, that 360 twist that you've been doing at Nazare, right? And at Jaws yeah. now. So I still think that's like, when I see that chop hop, I'm like, is there a way to chop hop, do that 360 land and then go? So maybe that's the that's the next progression down there yeah i was uh planning on going this summer but then covid hit and then it was just like oh it can't go so yeah maybe next year yeah wow um all right and the the final uh final question is let me oh if where's the next big wave discovery do you think you know like you know nazare came along and just was was not there and all of a sudden it's just giant like where where do you think the next that next spot that place is uh that's a good question um you know what it's i always think about that scenario how like it was only really in 2011 that everyone figured out that nazare was this crazy big wave and it was like in europe you know like a westernized country that you know the one of the biggest waves on the planet was in plain sight you know not even that far away from lisbon and it was like next to a harbor <laughs> like that's the best setup in the history of big waves. Like, I don't know anywhere else. Maybe Mavericks is just as close too, yeah. but like, it's even easier at Nazareth. You just go straight out and you're there. Yeah. Um, I've been trying to think about it. I know like maybe individuals like yourself, but like Greg Long and Ian Walsh, they know where the next one is, I think. And I've been trying to like pick their brains. Like, so like next trip, just call me up. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, I think it's like, maybe it is in some very obvious places but maybe those obvious places require special storms and i do remember seeing like um a giant like a, a giant hurricane that missed new york and sent giant waves to like nova scotia for example mm. it was pretty stormy it kind of resembled nazare but the waves looked like 70 feet and and i was just like gosh you just gotta be at the right place at the right time I don't know. I think Africa honestly has a lot of hidden gems. Yeah. Just Africa in general. When I went down there to surf Namibia a couple of years ago, I just realized truly how big that place was. And I thought to myself, you know, if someone's going to find it, it's probably Twiggy and he's probably already found it, but there has to be some nuts big waves down there. Cause just think about that untouched coastline. I mean, we just drove only a couple hours down the way and we were finding little beach breakaways. I'm like, there's just no reason why there isn't one down here. I just yeah. can't imagine why there wouldn't be. Maybe even South America. There hasn't, there's big waves in South America, like on the Pacific side, but I always wondered about like Argentina or something. Mm -hmm. Like, is there something down there sneaky? Like those big storms that come off of, you know, Cape Horn or like, yeah, Cape Horn and come around and just whack into that area. I, I got to start going on Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Kai Lenny, thank you so much, brother. And um, if thanks, hey, Jamie. Why don't you? Yeah, why don't you give the life of Kai a promo? Tell us when, where, how we can find it, where to access it. Yeah, so uh, you guys can watch Life of Kai on Red Bull TV. There's five episodes streaming for free. Free. You can binge watch it. It'll be slowly coming out on YouTube if you miss it on uh, Red Bull TV. But I guess the the whole story of my big wave season last year and we're going to start filming season two here soon uh hopefully we got a ton of big waves and 
could take um, everyone on some of my adventures that and the experiences that I go through to get there. Awesome, mate. Well, uh, good luck this season. Hope to see you out in the water at some stage. And uh, yeah, Hope thanks, so. Thanks for being on the podcast.